Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran, scrapbooking all of the DIY flyers for the gigs that you played in 1989, or else a scrappy upstart, archiving Instagram posts for shows that you played in 2014, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the first Friday of September 2022 and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made and it would always be some guy named Reginald who drove a Mazda 6 with a bumper sticker family of zombies and who was always trying to get you to be a co-conspirator in his illegal vape cartridge hustle. And old Reginald would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. But it's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free. The Working Songwriter Podcast listeners can go to bandzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS, the initials of our show, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, the first Sunday night of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm over on my YouTube channel for Sunday songs. That's a live stream. I'm live. I'm playing tunes live. I'm taking questions in the live chat. I'm taking requests in the live chat. It's a really fun, really interactive experience. I dare to say that we're building something of a little community over there, including many people who are listeners of this podcast. So come on over and be a part of it. That's the first Sunday night of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern. Head on over to joepugmusic.com and click on the live stream tab to set a reminder. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, You can become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You search for The Working Songwriter or you search for my name. Then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you certainly don't have to pay for, but that you choose to pay for because you dig the show and because you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month. If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thank you to everybody who's taken the time and the capital to support the show in that way. And if you're not in a position to support the show in that way, it's totally understandable. There's still a couple ways that you could help us out for free. First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store. Give us five stars or whatever it is. Or second, you could simply tell a friend about the show. Spread the word about the show. Text them an episode, a link to an episode that you think is good. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. I really hope that you enjoy this week's episode. Our guest this week is the creative force behind one of Canada's most inventive and beloved modern rock bands. 
Max Kerman founded Arkells when he was in university, and it wasn't long before their debut album, Jackson Square, became a popular and critical hit, bringing them to national and international prominence. They've recorded for Dine Alone Records and Universal Records Canada. They've toured with The Tragically Hip, Tokyo Police Club, Them Crooked Vultures, and many more. They've been nominated for and have won a slew of Juno Awards, including Group of the Year in 2012. The Huffington Post calls them Canadian rock radio mainstays, and Paste Magazine calls them Canada's best kept secret. I got a chance to catch up with Max on the phone a few weeks ago to hear about his musical journey so far. Max Kerman of Arkells, thanks for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. You founded the group when you were in college, but I'm kind of interested in before that, like the musical evolution that brought you to that point in the first place. What did music look like in your household growing up? Yeah, so my dad, uh, I'm Canadian, but my dad grew up in New York and then went to school in Detroit for university, went to Wayne State, which is right downtown Detroit. And he he was there in in like the mid to late 60s, and he was a DJ at the college radio station. So he got like advanced copies of, you know, Sgt. Pepper's and the latest Rolling Stones and, you know, Motown. So he trucked around those those LPs that he got from the 60s, like for the next 20 years, and then, you know, started a family in Toronto. And growing up, I like probably till about the age of 12, like the only thing I listened to was the Beatles and Motown. Like I just love that music so much. And I still love that music. Um, so we played, you know, he played. He, my dad played a little bit of guitar, but um, yeah, I just have a lot of fond memories of of listening to that kind of classic great songwriter music from from the 60s and um yeah that's probably where it began that's really cool because that was at a time when you know for him to pick up those motown records it had to do not with the internet which is ubiquitous but of like a a quirk of geographical you know uh Mm -hmm. like an artifact of of where he was geographically like that's where he picked up those records and then he physically moved them to a place where you were eventually born otherwise you wouldn't have had access to them no and i and we had a record player in the kitchen it's funny to think it's like it feels like i'm talking like i grew up in the 60s or something <laughs> but this was this would be like the 90s but we had a, a record player in our kitchen and you know some of my earliest memories are like bringing um abbey road to school in kindergarten and while the other kids were, you know, playing at the sand station or the water station during playtime, there was also, weirdly enough, a record player that, and I would just sit there and just listen to Maxwell Silverhammer <laughs> and uh, other Beatles tunes. And and also, it's like around that time in the mid '90s, like the Beatles anthology uh, series yeah. came out in '95. I got obsessed with that. I, I, I'm a friend that I met probably when I was like eight or nine, he was equally obsessed with the Beatles. So it was just like kind of living and breathing that music for, for, for a very long time. It's a really good melodic foundation, man, especially mm-hmm. that McCartney stuff. I mean, if, if you're getting that into your bloodstream at an early age, you're really going to learn some stuff about melody that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. And the chord changes too. I think that was the other thing about the Beatles stuff. It was just like, it just felt like, they they kind of went even though it was pop music they just went to places I'm like how do they think of that like you know compared to some of their contemporaries where you know you know if you look at like you know the Rolling Stones or something like that you're like that's great but it's like those are th- the same sort of three chords mostly over and over right which of course has its appeal with the Beatles like how did he how did they think to go to that chord that out I know. of nowhere you I know, know. I find that to be the case. I don't know if you've listened to them much, but uh, the American band, the band. uh, Of course. I was listening to them. I was listening to a record of theirs. Hey, actually, I don't want to. Four-fifths Canadian. Let's uh, let's Uh, put this. Okay. Okay. Actually, you know what? I I didn't mean to start shit there, but you're absolutely (laughs) right. I got to give it to you. Um, yeah. but, uh, we won't get into whether Levon was the heart and soul of that band or not, because sure. I, I don't want to fight with <laughs> you here, uh, Max. So Talk really. to Robbie Robertson about that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but, but very similar there too, as well. And speaking of Robbie Robertson, he was probably the architect of this where I'll be listening to, I was listening to that song when you awake the other day and mm-hmm. it lands on a C chord. It, 
in the chorus out of nowhere Mm -hmm. and you're like i don't even know if this song was in c Mm -hmm. before this and they just go back and forth uh, between that and the verse and uh yeah Yeah, i mean that was another big one for me because my dad also loved the band Mm -hmm. i don't know exactly how old i would have been when i got into it but but at, at a young age i remember listening to like the night they drove old dixie down going like that's like the greatest song ever written you know like and actually not to get too technical here but one of the beautiful things that Robbie does on that song which which like you know Paul which McCartney was really good at too was just like changing the bass note to, there's always some interesting inversion so it's like it, most writers would be like okay A minor C F D minor like whatever but there's like E A minor and then the E on the bottom right like yeah. and then and all this sort of building crescendo stuff that the bass allows you to do and and Robbie's an expert in that. When did music start to look like a thing for you that wasn't just going to be something that you listened to, but something that you participated in? So I probably in grade like eight or nine, I, I started to listen to like the modern sort of like pop music of the day. So this is like the late 90s, early 2000s and a lot of hip hop too. Mm-hmm. Like I got super into like basketball and hip hop culture and music and like, you know, like Jay-Z and Nas uh and you know the early 2000s like the pharrell stuff like i just like and also like you know it's funny i just saw there's a new musical that's going to broadway called and juliet and it's based on have you heard of this Mm -mm. oh it's pretty spectacular um it was just running in toronto it's going to broadway and it's the story of if juliet did not kill herself and took her own life back and it's like this sort of female empowerment story it's very feel good it's written by the guy who wrote the, the show Shit's Creek, which is a very yeah. uh, feel-good yeah. show. But the, I bring this up because the music is all Max Martin songs. So it's oh, all wow. Max Martin music. And I'm a huge Max Martin fan. And so that music in the late 90s, early 2000s, and the Backstreet Boys in sync. Like, so that kind of just like era of pop music I got got really into. And it's just probably because my peers were listening to it. It's funny, like I don't really have much of a, a background on like 90s alternative rock or, mm. you know, or 2000 punk music like a little bit but not much like my it's always been sort of like pop feel good songwriting yeah um so i listened to that probably you know grade eight through grade 10 and then i still listen to that music but then i remember my dad this is kind of a funny one but uh my dad who's always like kind of despite being you know a, a child of the 60s and 70s and liking that kind of music he was always interested in new music and he still is he's always he's he's into discovery and I remember like in the 90s, he got really into Moby. And I was like, what the hell is this? I was like a kid. I'm like, what are we listening to? Like the big play record. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and um, anyway, in probably 2002, maybe, um, he brought home Ben Folds 5, Rock in the Suburbs. Hmm. And I remember, and we were on a trip. We were on like a trip to Buffalo to see the Bills play. And I remember him playing Losing Lisa, which is a song off that record. It was like just not, not a single or anything. I was like, oh, this kind of reminds me of the Beatles just a little bit like it reminds mm-hmm. me of like Paul McCartney songwriting uh, to my simple brain and I remember then kind of becoming absolutely obsessed with Ben Folds and then Ben going back and getting into Ben Folds 5 and the piano playing on that is uh, is very accessible in a lot of ways there's some intricate stuff but there's some just like simple like chord poundy things that you can kind of like learn for yourself I was like oh this is um, this is kind of exciting so Probably in like grade 10 and 11, I, I, I started to learn how to play guitar. I had taken piano lessons as a kid quite badly. Mm-hmm. Um, but and I, and I didn't love reading music. I wasn't particularly good at it. But I, um, but I was like, oh, I can start to learn Ben Fold songs. And from there, yeah. and I kind of had my first girlfriend. I was like, I start writing songs about her. And, and I just remember it was like, it really took over me. And it, like, there's not too many things in my life that I have like a very sort of like unrelenting dedication to figuring out. Like I'm, I'm kind of the mind. I'm like, eh, if I can't figure out how to fix that thing, someone else will fix it for me. Or like, <laughs> right. uh, like I get frustrated quickly and I don't like be- feeling frustrated. So mm-hmm. I usually like give up on stuff if it gets too hard. Yeah. <laughs> this is, but when it, when it came to like music and like figuring out a song, I was, it, w- it would occupy my mind and it would just like, you know, it was the only thing that mattered. And I remember like going down to the local music store and like renting like, a four track recorder mm-hmm. and like just like I need to figure out how this works because I need to record the thing that I just wrote. And that's sort of, I guess uh, when I knew that like, this felt a little bit different than most other things. 
It's interesting. I think in in a way you paid Ben Folds the highest compliment um, in the sense that I, I think that's the highest compliment you can pay a songwriter, which is someone who doesn't play yet. When they hear the song, they think to themselves, I could do that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's not a backhanded compliment at all. It means that they're so good at writing songs that um, it, it immediately appeals to the ear in a way that feels like understandable to the listener. Um, mm-hmm. So it, 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 go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. It, no, so I, I was just, I, I was thinking like that, um, if I was Ben Folds and I heard this interview, I'd think to myself like, damn, man, like that's, that's great that I was able to write songs that a young person felt like they could get their arms around and, and try themselves. Yeah, and I also think that the other quality about his writing, which, which I probably drawn, allowed me to kind of get into it, was um, it was funny, right? Like, and it was yeah. sort of self-deprecating, and it just felt more relatable because I think there was so much music from the '90s that was like really like angsty and angry or dark or too mysterious, and I, I don't really identify with a lot of those those qualities mm-hmm. personally. But Ben Foles like wrote in this really conversational way. Like everything was sort of like a dialogue. He had really vivid characters. Um, it, it was like there's some, there's sad songs, there's, there's some optimism, but yeah, it's just kind of like funny and and interesting. And I was like, oh, I've never really seen anybody write like that. At least at least for me at the time. Have you ever seen him live before? Uh, oh yeah. Then then from there, oh, oh, like my dad and I went to go see him perform a bunch of times, and he's so great. He's amazing. I I was never. I was kind of like the music, but I never was a hardcore fan. And then when I was like 25, I just happened to see a show. Um, him, I don't know if the, it was the Ben Folds Five, but it was just him and a rhythm section. And mm-hmm. to this day, I mean, you know, 15, 20 years later, I still think about that show. It was one of the best shows I've ever seen, that power trio. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of singular. It's like, who else does that? Who else like plays piano like with that kind of aggression, but also can be beautiful? And kind of in- includes the audience in such an yeah. interesting way. Like he gets, he divides the audience and he gets them to sing harmonies and his hardcore fans know when to do the claps at the right time, like right. all that stuff. I was like, you know, and I think those qualities were informative for me as like a, a live performer too, where I'm like, oh, you can like make this into an ensemble you get, if you get everybody involved. It's interesting to me that starting out, <laughs> one of the first things that you did is go to grab a, uh, like a tape deck, like a four track thing mm. to record. And you, you probably missed by just like five years. If it, if you'd been five years later, it just would have been a MacBook, mm. right? And a, and a USB yeah. mic or something like that. But it's kind of cool that it started with a four track. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Like, um, yeah, my neighbors across the street, uh, Alex is a 18 months older. Eli's 18 months younger. And Eli played the drums. Alex played guitar. So and their their parents were very like patient with letting us jam down there all the time and we'd throw like birthday parties. I think for my like seventeenth birthday, like in my house we had like just a performance. <laughs> it was like m- me and the high school band. Uh, you know, I, we probably played some originals. We probably played. I'm trying to think. Like you know, M- Mr. Jones, <laughs> my Cannon Crow, yeah, and hell Weezer yeah, and Coldplay, yeah, man, like Yellow, like all those all those songs. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we, we got to, and play, we played the local talent shows and, you know, at, at the various high schools and stuff. So like, I definitely like, kind of caught the bug in high school to be like, oh, this is actually like very exciting. Well then talk to me, you end up at university at McAllister and that's where you would found the band, but it's not like you were, you were studying music there or anything like that. You were studying political science. So how did you, you know, at what point did it switch over and say like, all right, well, I'm not going to have a normal life here, man. I'm going to go rock and yeah. roll. We're going to do this. Like what happened? Yeah. So uh, the place called McMaster. It's, it's in McMaster. Hamilton. McMaster. Oh, I thought it was McAllister. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. No, it's, it's down the road. And I, yeah, I kind of went to school specifically trying to meet new people to start a band. Mm-hmm. Kind of felt like, um, I just was like looking for new collaborators mm-hmm. at the time. And also just kind of the prospect of going away to school, leaving the house was all kind of exciting. But I, so basically, you know, the great thing about Frosh Week, Welcome Week, is that everybody's friendly. Nobody really knows each other, you know. So in the first couple of days of school, I just started profiling people, going like, could this person look like they are in a band? Just like, who looks like they could be into music? <laughs> it was sort of what I did. So just about every single person I met, I'd go, oh, what kind of music are you into? Just kind of seeing if we had similar tastes. And, and then the second, and if they had um, similar tastes, then I'd say, oh, do you play an instrument? So um, this was uh, fall 2004, 
and that um, that summer, I was into this band. I don't know if they really made too much of a dent in America, but they're kind of a, an important indie rock band of that era called the Weaker Thans from Winnipeg. Have you yeah, heard, have you heard I of have, I Thans? certainly have. Yeah. Okay. And and John K. Sampson, the writer in that band, is a, is a very like influential. Uh, songwriter, really smart to, to the people that know. So um, meet this guy. I'm like, oh, what, what kind of music are you into? And he goes, oh, well, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of really into this band. You, you probably never heard of them. They're from Winnipeg. They're called the Weaker Thans. I'm like, and my eyes kind of light up and I push him. I'm like, what? I'm very excited. Yeah. And he, I'm like, do you play an instrument? He's like, uh, I kind of play guitar. I'm like, you're in the band. You're in. And he's like, oh, what? <laughs> you're in. He's like, what? And that's Mike. And that's Mike, our guitarist to this day. Um, and then the next day, um, I, I was wearing this, uh, shirt, Sam Roberts band and Sam Roberts band up here again, a great Canadian rock and roll band who at the time were just kind of becoming the new big thing. And someone came up to me and said, I really like your shirt. That's I love, I love Sam Roberts band. And I was like, do you play an instrument? And he goes, oh, I kind of play the bass. I'm like, you're in the band. <laughs> and, uh, and that was Nick. And that's our bassist, uh, Nick, uh, in our Kells. So um, we we immediately started jamming. I had a bunch of songs that I w- was excited to kind of figure out. And um, we jammed through for the kind of the full year. In the in the spring of that, of, of like that school year, we played in the McMaster Battle of the Bands. And then we played our first club show. And the band basically kind of worked all through undergrad. Like we took school seriously enough to, mm-hmm. to you know. Um, and then about um, halfway through fourth year, we had made like a, an EP. And unbeknownst to us, the EP had been picked up at a show by a guy who wrote, who, who ran the Dakota Tavern, which was like a very cool hangout bar in Toronto for music types to, to be around. Mm-hmm. And he was giving the EP out. Because he was like, oh, this band's awesome. I, he bought six copies. Mm-hmm. He ended up giving it to a manager who listened to it and was like, oh, this is actually really good. The manager came out and saw us play, really liked us. And about probably halfway through our final year, senior year, fourth year, um, he was like, I want to work with you. So we were like, okay, this is great. Let us, um, we got three more months of school. We'll make our parents happy. We'll graduate. And then we're mm-hmm. all yours. And that's, that's what happened. So basically, um, that's summer of 2008 we're done mm-hmm. we go we go on tour getting open for the black crows we do wow. three dates with them uh we're playing some festivals our first record jackson square comes out in that fall mm-hmm. uh in october t- 2008 and that's sort of been the gig ever since like we were very lucky in that that sort of awkward period after university it's like are you gonna get a job are you gonna go travel are you gonna take this music thing more seriously it was sort of decided for us we didn't have to make that decision it was like oh no like we're, we graduated and like we're going we're traveling boys right. like let's hit the road so it was, it was pretty awesome it's funny what you just described <laughs> there like that trajectory that you just mm-hmm. described it makes perfect sense like if you were to explain that to like an 18 year old they'd be like yeah that's exactly how it's all going to go it's going to be fine mm-hmm. but now that you're older can you kind of recognize like how unlikely all those turns were to like have it work out like this i mean that's a pretty you really threaded the needle there yeah it's um yeah, no, I've, I've always felt very lucky about it because I think like we were all very realistic with like, you know, how hard, you know, being a full time working musician who, who's writing their own songs, like how hard that is. Like, I don't think we were ever like, oh, yeah, this is how it's supposed to happen. Like everybody in the band is like pretty realistic. And so I think w- right from the get, we realized how precious it was. And then we were like, OK, we got to work really, really hard. And so because sometimes you see bands that they get a lot early and just think like that's the way it is and then when the band falls yeah. apart because they're not hustling hard enough or they're not or they're not recognizing how their good fortune you know they're working at a coffee shop you know a few years later so we yeah. were always like no and that's honestly even to this day i'm like fuck 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 like we cannot lose this thing <laughs> what are we doing today what are we doing today <laughs> you know <laughs> that's how well it's re- it's really tough in that sense to make it happen over time cuz it it just you can give some people something that they love but then you have to continue to keep them engaged over time i think about just myself as a consumer of music one of my favorite songwriters is gillian welch i love Mm -hmm. gillian welch right and i was thinking about it the other day i'm like i love her music i haven't bought anything from her in like seven years you know what Mm -hmm. i mean and but and i still consider myself a fan if she were to come through town maybe i'd go to see the show but even the people that you engage who love your music they might go a long stretch without you know 
engaging with you commercially mm-hmm. at all. So it's tough to keep it going over time. It's so hard, you know, and we've been thinking about this a lot lately, actually. It's like we think about all the bands, all of our peers that we came up with in that would have put out, you know, early records in 2008, 2009, 2007, whatever. Most of those bands don't exist anymore. No. Or, or if they do, they're not working a lot and it's just kind of on the wrong side of the hill. And it's not because they're not good bands. It's just it's just fucking hard. <laughs> it's just really hard. So to your point, though, it's like that that's been a real um, like everyday like big picture thinking point for us. It's like, OK, like how do we like keep the job interesting for us? How do we not do the same thing over and over again? How do we evolve? How do we reach new people? How do we keep our, our audience guessing? You know, I, I think and I think like it's hard to do. And inevitably, you're going to lose people along the way. But, you know, you think about the greats. It's like, you know, whether that's Kanye West or the Beatles or Bowie, it's like, okay, like they kept their audience on their toes because they kept changing, you know, and they weren't afraid to be fearless and and to do things differently and change their process and to collaborate with new people. And I think that, you know, that that's been that's been one of our like main goals, especially lately. And it's been really fun. When that first album, Jackson Square, comes out, you said around 2008, things like, you know, they take on a pretty fast momentum. You guys end up um, with a Juno Award in 2010 for, you know, a new group of the year, and then in 2012 for just straight up group of the year. That's a pretty fast arc. How did you uh, handle all of that success? Um, yeah, I, I think we... It was exciting, but again, it wasn't like we were all of a sudden like millionaires or something. Like that. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was very much like, okay, if we played in Calgary for two hundred people, like how can we get to four hundred people? Mm-hmm. Okay, we got to four hundred. How can we? And it's always been like that for us. It's it's never been like, oh my god, like all of a sudden we're celebrities or something right, like that. It's right. always it's always been very incremental, um, and. We also kind of know how fleeting it is as well. So it never, uh, and you know, we probably didn't get on our first tour bus in, until 2013. Until the, so it's like, you know, when I think about 2012 maybe, uh, you know, the first four years, it was just like you're in a van, you're sharing hotel rooms, you're, you're playing 150, 200 days a year, you're kind of constantly tired, you know, it's like you're working a lot and, you know, uh, so it, I don't think we had too much time to to be like, okay, now we're going to take a break or something like that. We're like, go, go, go. Yeah. Getting better at your instrument is an essential part of being a songwriter. When you play better guitar, you write better songs. It's that simple. How do you do that, though? Sure, you could get lessons from the neighbor who majored in minor chord inversions at the Waldorf School. But that'll cost you an arm and a leg. Or else you could pull up YouTube and pay nothing at all, but that becomes the ultimate time suck. You'll end up sifting through videos of nerds unironically weeping as they recreate Pink Floyd's The Wall on a Parker fly guitar through a rack mount delay pedal. What's the sweet spot in between? Peghead Nation, the online home for American Roots music. They feature curated video workshops with world-class instructors on guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, upright bass, dobro, and ukulele. They have levels of instruction that meet the needs of both scrappy upstarts and grizzled veterans. And most importantly, all of it comes in at a low monthly subscription that actual strap-for-cash songwriters can easily afford. To start taking classes yourself, head on over to PegheadNation.com to check out their 50 available courses. Enter the promo code TWS, the initials of our show, to get your first month free. You can also send a gift subscription to the songwriter in your life or to the player in your band who needs a not-so-subtle hint about their playing prowess. Peghead Nation, when you play better guitar, you write better songs. It's that simple. Max 
Hawks and the Arkells have expanded their sound over the last decade and a half, but they've done so without losing their core identity. Losing touch with what is most important is a hazard that is common to all lives, not just creative lives. And there's a wonderful poem by Ann Porter about that sense of losing touch with what is essential. It's entitled, After Psalm 137. We're still in Babylon, but we do not weep. Why should we weep? We have forgotten how to weep. We've sold our harps and bought ourselves machines that do our singing for us. And who remembers now the songs we sang in Zion? We have got used to exile. We hardly notice our captivity. For some of us, there are such comforts here, such luxuries, even a guard to keep the beggars from annoying us. Jerusalem, we have forgotten you. As you guys were getting started touring a bit, you're playing with bands like, uh, you get some opening slots for bands like the Black Crows, stuff like that. Mm. Who were some bands that kind of came before you that you guys worked with that you kind of uh, learned the ropes from? Did you guys have any kind of mentor situations with bands that you felt helped you along the way? Um, I'd say like, you know, I think we've had really positive touring experiences with just about everybody that we've ever toured with. Um and I'm trying to think like the early tours who we who we uh, would have opened for. I mean, there's a big one. Uh, we opened for the Tragically Hip, um, oh. who are a big, important Canadian rock band. Um, we toured with. Oh, jeez, I'm not, I'm so bad at remembering my, our own stuff. Uh, we toured with so many goddamn bands. We toured with Frank Turner, uh, yeah. and Frank Frank's awesome, and we learned so much from him. But I'd say that um, we. I always feel very lucky that when we were kind of coming of age and starting the band and being in Hamilton, being not in Toronto, we got to see so m- and so many great indie rock bands from the 2000s um, who were just a little bit older than us and we could learn from them. So it's like, think about, and, and, and on the Canadian side especially, it's like Arcade Fire, Broken Social Scene, yeah. Feist, Stars, The Constantines, Joel Plaskett, The Weaker Thans, um, the new pornographers, Tegan and Sarah, like all those bands w- were Canadian. So they were like around a lot. And if they played to a thousand people in, in Toronto, they'd come to Hamilton and the venue size would be 400 people or 300 people. Um, you know, and sometimes they'd be on tour with an American band, like uh, OK Go would come through on a joint bill, right? So it's like there was a, so much great music that we were like just stealing from (laughs) so when you listen to jackson square that sound is definitely influenced from that great era of like 2000s indie rock and a lot of that was like born in canada you just blew my mind that really was a that was an era right and obviously a lot of those bands are still still working and doing their thing but when they were first coming out all those bands that you just described who are all canadian um Mm. that was it was a scene man you know Oh my! It was amazing, and there's actually a book that just came out. Um, it's called "Hearts on Fire" about that era, it's just the era mm. before us. Michael Barclay was the, was the author, and um, yeah, I remember going to see a festival on Toronto Island. This was in like 2003, and the headliners. Do you do you know Sloan? I don't know. Sloan's like a great like power pop 70s power pop. A quartet they all sing oh, sorry for all the Canadian references here but th- them and Sam Roberts were like headlining the show but we got there and it was like an all day affair on Toronto Island and opening the show at like noon I missed them it was Arcade Fire oh wow and, and then next up was Death From Above <laughs> Um, and then after that was The Stills who were signed to uh, Vice Records who are a very cool Montreal band and then like bro- then the Constantines who were signed to Sub Pop, then Broken Social Scene. It was just like, and that's before you even got to the headliner. So it was just like, yeah, there's so many, so many great bands from from that from that time. The the Arcade Fire were kind of like I feel like that was the last kind of um, college radio buzz band. Like that, they put out Funeral. It gets that amazing review um, from Pitchfork, and then all of a sudden they just become like these 
these hipster darlings all over North America. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was in college in North Carolina, and, and you know, it was a big deal down there. So, Well, they were on Verge, right? So that's a North Carolina label, Merge, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. I, actually, yeah. that's a good point. That's probably why I knew them. But, I mean, they, they were everywhere as well in the States. No, they and, were everywhere. And, you know, the yeah. Bowie was getting up on stage with them. I mean, you know, we were joking about the band earlier. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll give credit to the Americans in Arcade Fire, because even though they're a Montreal band, Wynn Butler is from Texas. Right. Or, yeah, he's from Houston. And uh, his brother in the, was in the band then, too. And they had, like, I think that one of the things that separated Arcade Fire with the rest, versus the rest of the Canadians is that, like, they had, like, an American fuck you, get out of my way, like, I'm going to take over the world kind of attitude. And, that's, and, that, and they were very fearless in that way, um, more so than the, all of the other peers. And, uh, and, you know, they, they just headlined a big festival in Montreal that we played Oshiega last week, two weekends ago. And they're just as good as ever. I'm such a huge Arcade Fire fan. I love them. It's, well, and that's another example I was saying earlier that, you know, oh, I'm a Gillian Welch fan, but I haven't, you know, bought anything from her. And, and same with Arcade Fire. Now that they come up in conversation, I'm like, oh, yeah, I mean, I love that. New band. record's good. I was just listening to it, like, just before we started this interview. It's really good. All right, really man. Good. Well, I'm going to go Spotify yeah. it after, after this interview here. Uh, you guys have been really, you've been really prolific over the years. You've put out a lot of records. It always feels like you're either putting out a record or, or you're working on a new project. Talk to me a little bit about your your creative process and how you've maintained such a steady flow of of music over the last decade and a half. Yeah, I mean, it's changed uh, a little bit, and I think that's good. I think, you know, when we first started... Um, Usually, you know, I'd have some kind of semblance of a of a, an acoustic demo written on the usually written on the piano. I'm not really good at home recording. <laughs> you know, I the, the the extent of my home recording was that four track uh, <laughs> tape player, and then I kind of stopped. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I usually kind of bring the band some kind of idea that I was kind of pumped on, and then we'd sort of flush it out together. And that was kind of you know how we how we did the first three records i want to say up okay. to high noon and um and then since then i think i've become more collaborative like it the, i kind of probably started to get a little tired of myself and i'm like okay you're doing the thing that you always do and um and you're okay here's the thing and you know it's like i don't know uh, I, I was sort of like getting bored with myself so we've done a few more co-writes, which has been really eye-opening for me with like different producers and other songwriters because, you know, they just take you to a place that you wouldn't have got to yourself and you're able to start bouncing these ideas back and forth. And, and, and also like even with the lyric writing, like I'm always sort of open, I'm like, oh, is there a better way to say this? And, you know, the guys in the band will have suggestions, um, you know, with the more recent stuff, like, you know, a lot of the songs are started with just instrumental pieces that, often Tony, our keyboard player, or Mike will send to me. I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting, and I'll just get to start just writing melodies over top of it. And that's been really cool and really liberating to, to just to be able to like get another piece of music because your mind works differently if you're walking down the street listening to an instrumental piece of music than if you have a guitar in your hand or if you're sitting at a piano because then you become more conscious of like, there's the G chord, there's the C, there's the E minor. You, you're... You, you, some of your preconceived like biases for like what music is kind of get, gets in the way of just like, no, just write something interesting melodically over top of it. So I've had a really good time uh, lately, especially in the last few records, just doing stuff with other people. And I think that that's kept it really interesting. And also just like, you know, hearing other stories about how other music's made. Cause I think if you come up, uh, from the school that I came up in. It's like, no, a song is written like Paul McCartney. He sat at the piano and then he wrote, you know, let it be. And that's how you write the song. That's how, like, that's the only way a song can come together. And then when you start learning about how other people write music, you go, Oh, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, you know, Max Martin, the way he's been relevant for the last 30 years is he just keeps on finding new, amazing talent to collaborate with, not only on the artist side, but on the production side, on the songwriting side. And, um, even you know the, i'm sure you listen to the podcast song exploder mm-hmm. um and it's just like that's been eye opening to me where you go oh my god like there are so many different ways to find the answer when you're when you're working on a song and um i'd say for this last album or so the album that's coming out um 
that's been by far the most collaborative record. Like we were leaving verses empty and sending them to our favorite artists being like, can you write the verse here and you sing wow. on it? <laughs> so that's where we're kind of at right now, which is cool, which I enjoy. Wow. I mean, almost what you're describing, they're both working with producers to write or, or uh, you know, having your keyboard player send you an instrumental piece. You're, you're kind of talking about uh, like willfully confusing yourself, willfully mm-hmm. getting a step ahead of yourself so that you you don't have the option to to fall back on something that is familiar. Yeah, totally. It's like, cause otherwise you're just sort of, you, I don't know. I think your mind can play tricks on you when you're, when you're sitting at the piano because you, it's because sometimes you can only process so much information, but there's just something like you're trying to get to that state of like freedom, <laughs> like, like, you know, uh, cr- cr- creative freedom where nothing is sort of getting in your way. And so the guys that we worked on the last record with Tom and Ryan, just really brilliant guys who just really love so much. And I've learned so much from them, Ryan Spraker and Tom Payton. And, you know, they, they work in LA and, and they're writing with all kinds of artists all the time. But when I first met them, like compared to some of the other co-writes where you kind of just start to try to get in there and start writing something, they just kind of were just talking. They're really into basketball. I'm really into basketball. So we're talking about basketball or talking or showing stuff on Twitter, like, and like two or three hours would pass. And I'm, I'm kind of like thinking to myself, like, guys, are we going to get to the fucking song already? <laughs> like, and then they'd be like, ah, let's go for lunch. I'm like, what are we doing here? Yeah. Like, can we work please? And then their strategy is to like actively disengage from thinking about <laughs> writing music. But then something would happen where like Ryan would be sort of at the piano talking about basketball, but then he'd do something and Tom would go, Oh, what was that thing? Oh, what if you want? And then, and then the song would start to grow and, and like, yeah. So they sort of insist on not doing music for the first like three hours of hanging out with them during a co-write just to let your mind be free. Yeah. And I think there's like something to that. It's like, because if you're thinking about trying, oh, what's the song? What's the song? What's the song? What's the song? Yeah, yeah. Then you're kind of fucked. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I learned that from them. We're just like, how do you actively try not to write the song to write the song? <laughs> well, it's also brilliant because it, it takes into account the fact that when something beautiful does come out, it comes out in an instant and then it's done. Mm-hmm. And, and it, yeah. d- it didn't exist 10 seconds ago and then 10 seconds later now it exists and and the actual writing process is is real fast so i mean yeah i mean if you have four hours to write a song why not spend three and a half hours looking at twitter and talking about the raptors (laughs) if it's just going to take a minute and a half to get this hook right Mm -hmm. totally yeah so um yeah so you know we on on blink once which came out last september we did um a song with Kay Flay, uh and she's an amazing sort of alternative artist who sings and kind of raps a bit and just is a little bit of everything she's very cool very smart and we left the the, the kind of second verse open to see what she'd do and then she kind of came in the studio and just started kind of reacting to the music and her verse is like just incredible so i was like oh this is so cool like i want to do more of that um so Blink Twice, which is sort of the companion record, is coming out um, this September, uh, September 23rd. And the record is like half of the record is just that. It just features. So we have um, Wes, Wes Schultz from the Lumineers, who's on a song. Mm-hmm. Tegan and Sarah are on a song. Ali and AJ and Curdy Pirat, who is a French-Canadian artist. Um, Cold War Kids, uh, Nathan from Cold War Kids. Are, and... And it was very much, I kind of realized, like, I guess I'm sort of playing like the A&R guy where I'm just kind of like reaching out, you know, to different like-minded artists to see if they'd want to be involved based on the song. And and uh, and it's really fun for me to listen to because I'm like, oh, it's like I, I get I get a jolt. I get high when I when I hear that new voice come in and, and, and take over uh, a verse on, on one of our songs. You get me really excited because I think I get stuck in that mode. I mean, the way that you described it is like, well, you just got to be Paul McCartney right in front of the the ivories by yourself. And that's the only way to do it. I get stuck in that mode a lot. I think a lot of people do. But what you're describing right here, I mean, there's a lot of genres of music where this is this is the standard way of of composing. Well, that's it. I mean, I think, you know, like the foundation of uh, of our band and who I am as a songwriter is that right is is you sort of that like 
Lennon McCartney, you're at a piano, you're just sort of like figuring out the song for yourself. But I'm, I love hip hop, I love electronic music, I love pop music. And you start hearing stories about like, oh, you can do that? That's how they put the song together? Huh. Yeah. And you know what I mean? You're, okay, why don't, like, well, I kind of want to do that. <laughs> so yeah, I think it is about being open-minded and curious about just how other people do their work. And again, like, you know, when you, when you, when you get a glimpse into other people's process, you kind of realize you've been creating all these militant rules right? right. <laughs> that like you just made up, you just invented, like who says you have to do it like that? Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when you realize that there's lots of ways to do it and then, and then you're kind of liberated. There's a, it reminds me of a, there's a Ray Wiley Hubbard quote. He's a t- uh, songwriter from Texas and he kind of speaks to that ethos where he says, uh, uh, writing a song is like a cat giving birth. You just go under the steps alone and fucking do it. And, <laughs> and, and there, there is something to that, but there is, like you said, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different ways to, to get the job done, and it can be like that, but it can also be in this more collaborative mode that you're talking about. That, that is actually something that I'm really interested in, the, the collaborative aspect of it. You mentioned earlier so many of the bands that you, you know, were kind of of your graduating class or whatever, and, you know, 2008 when they put out their debut record. So many of them don't even exist anymore. I would mm-hmm. say of those that do exist, very few of them would have as many like core remaining founding members as you have. Mm-hmm. You, you have found a way to, over the course of a decade and a half, remain creative with the same partners for a very long time. That's a pretty unique and unheard of thing what do you think is most essential about collaborating with people um over time yeah it's a good question um i think you know it's, it, there's always going to be hurdles right especially when there's you know five folks involved and and it's meaningful to everybody and everyone's equally invested everyone's equally getting paid like everybody's like it's going to be a learning experience probably every time but i think like there's a foundational trust that we have all with each other that we're all like trying to move this thing forward together. And, um, and I think, you know, we, we trust each other, especially in the areas that we're kind of responsible for. Like everyone's sort of like, you know, going to do their very best in the thing that they really take pride in. So I think like appreciating that in each other is, is a big part of it. And also just like, you know, I think I hate to use this term when we're talking about something that's artistic and creative, but it's like, it's just really competitive too. Like it's just such a competitive industry. Yeah. I think I heard some stat. There's like 40,000 new songs on Spotify every day. (laughs) And it's such a crowded, it's such a crowded marketplace. And and so the stuff has to be really excellent. It has to be interesting and, and, and you can't fall back on your old set of tricks. The thing that worked for you five years ago might not be the thing that's knocking down any doors right now. And again, I don't like mean to come off like, because it should be, songwriting should be a precious thing that's near and dear to your heart. And that that is really important. But I think just being like really mindful of like, okay, what is the thing that is actually exciting, that's actually different? And how do we achieve that? And I think if we all sort of, recognize that like that that's the goal because the goal is like holding on to this like it's our job for dear life <laughs> then then we'll be okay so i think i think everybody kind of gets that like you know all the all the things that make this job impossible and that we're all in it together to sort of like figure out how to make something that's really special and different hearing that there's 40,000 songs a day uploaded to spotify it makes me want to take a long walk off a short pier <laughs> i know right <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> it is. It's interesting, though, what you say about trust, and particularly about you know trusting everyone in your group to you kind of trust them with their own domain. I've found in any enterprise, whether I'm working for somebody or someone's working for me, the best way to undermine trust is when you kind of question you kind of question the the one thing that the person was brought in to do. You know what I mean? Because uh-huh. at that point you say, okay, well, maybe I'm not the guy to be here for this. You know what I mean? Or, or maybe we should have hired someone else here. Because if you were brought in to do this, probably we shouldn't micromanage that, you know? Yeah, and I think I think everybody's guilty to a degree of micromanaging. And I'm like sort of, you know, the big picture planner guy. <laughs> like the idea of a bit of like, what if we, what if, what if we did, what if we did this, what if we did that? That's like always me. 
<coughs> Sorry, I got a bad cough. I'm going to walk to cut this out. Um, but I think I'm also like, number one, not very good at most other things. Uh, and I don't necessarily trust myself with most other. So if somebody has like, if Tim has like a drummer thought, I'm like, okay, whatever you think, because like you've clearly been studying this a lot more than I have. Like, I'm like, I'm not very good at a lot of the other stuff. So like, I'm more prone to, I think for the most part, like trust people's instincts, uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, how they want to execute their part. And also we hire a producer, right? Like a producer is, is this, is the communicator between all of us and is, is also the, the person that slightly outside of the project that can offer, you know, direction for everybody. Well, you certainly cannot argue with the results. It's been absolutely fascinating talking with you today, man. I think before I let you go, I do need to let our listeners know because this is only a, uh, uh, audio and not visual that both of us are guilty of wearing our own merchandise uh, yeah, today. There you go. <laughs> so not just me you as well um, <laughs> um listen man a real pleasure to talk with you thanks so much for coming on the podcast yeah likewise where, where are you uh right now i'm uh right outside of washington dc i live here with my family in uh in maryland we've lived all over oh. Oh, got, yeah, that's right you mentioned that yeah okay, i got well, my, yeah, let us know next time you you want to come to the show we'd love to love to hang out in person love it man thanks take it easy awesome peace all right, cheers This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Arkell's forthcoming album is entitled Blink Twice, available everywhere music is sold or streamed on September 23rd of this year. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.